celebrate. If you've not done so, I invite you to take the white booklets on the inside and pass those around uh, for all of our guests and visitors. A very warm welcome to you as we gather together on this day. We do hope the Spirit uh, fills you and brings love and hope and peace uh, among you. We also want to invite you, if you have a prayer request, to please write legibly on the, the card in that little booklet and put that in the offering plate, and we'd be glad to share that as part of our prayer ministry, not only here, but in our email outreach that we do as well. We uh, want to give thanks for a few things. Uh, if you could move me ahead there, please. Um, we just, uh, Beth, Beth is in the back getting all wired up. We just uh, finished a reception uh, for Pastor Beth. This is her last Sunday with us. Uh, and that's uh, sad for many of us, but uh, we ask for blessings to be with her on her journey. Uh, you'll have time after service just to meet and greet and be with her uh, as well and to wish her well on her next phase of her journey. Uh, I, I'm doing a little song. There she is. So uh, we do want to give thanks uh, for Pastor Matthew. I was waiting for the actual dance. Come on, Paul. <laughs> we, did, we did a square dance once. So we'll do it. So, uh, so you're going to miss me? <laughs> of course I oh, am. Okay. <laughs> We do give thanks for uh, uh, our wonderful partnership and ministry over these it's last two and a half years. And so uh, we hold you here in our hearts. Thank, Thank you. And for many. We do want to give thanks today for uh, many things. And uh, I do, before we go any further, I do want to just uh, lift up. Uh, we have so many people who help out around our church, whether it be our sound people, our bands. Uh, a lot of hidden things go on. Uh, one thing I, uh, one person I really want to lift up today because they, they go above and beyond all the time. Uh, they make it safe for you to get into this building after all, all the snow we had. Um, and so I lift up Scott. Uh, he is here every day, mm -hmm. covered with snow, literally, uh, just being bombarded. But he is here plowing and moving and shoveling and yelling and screaming and uh, <laughs> trying to court it all. I just want to give a shout out to Scott once again. So thank you. You do the man. Dave, Dave Paul wants to know if you can make the snow go away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Scott, for that. Because I, I, I mean, he's here before everybody, and, and mm -hmm. uh, it's, oh, man, it's awesome. Thank you. So we do uh, want to just lift up a lot of things for having. We have our Listos book sale going on. You want to talk a little bit more yeah, about that? Yeah, just outside. You probably saw them as you came into church, and if you didn't, make sure you take a look through them. Um, so all of the, uh, as books get sold, then more books become available to Listos to get. So there are uh, Spanish language as well as English language books out there. Um, the company that is out there, Esborn, is amazing books. So if you have kids in your life, if you have neighbors with kids, um, make sure you take a look through them because they really are some really significantly awesome books. Um, and buy, buy greatly so that we can benefit Listos and get them some new books as well. And they are great books. They, they are sold. amazing. <laughs> so we're going to have the Battling Nairs this morning. Is this on now? So the Women's Retreat and Men's Retreat is coming. Who wants to go first? Mark, there you go. You're a smart man. Okay. So the Women's Retreat will be um, April 5th, 6th, and 7th. Um, it will be an awesome time to come and rejuvenate. Yeah, time for some deep reflection as far as who you are and who you want to be and um, some time to just laugh and be with other women. So I encourage you to get signed up today if you can. Thank you, Marie. And for the men, we are planning a very special time in May. So let's all fantasize about May and spring and, you know, May in Minnesota is really one of the nicest times to be here. And how many, of, I'm going to ask you a question, men. How many of you sometimes feel like a human doing rather than a human being? Yeah? I know I do sometimes. So this is going to be a special time for uh, uh, us to come together as men, uh, to share fellowship with one another, to get reconnected with uh, the spirit and to uh, connect with other men. It is open to all men, even men that are not uh, members of this church. So if you have a friend that you would like to bring along, we would uh, certainly enjoy that. It is going to be at Mount Olivet uh, near Farmington. 
It's a beautiful camp. It's a Lutheran church camp uh, with many uh, you know, nature-type uh, grounds. We'll be doing some uh, walking and contemplating, hiking, exploring, socializing, and having a great time. So we'd invite you to get registered as soon as possible so we can be sure to save a place for you. Thank you. And we'll be snowshoeing and cross country. No, no. So you can sign up for both those at the welcome desk. They have all the forms out there. If you have more questions, see Tom and Marie afterwards. We'd really love to make sure that we get a great turnout for this. We also have our Ash Wednesday service coming up this coming Wednesday. Uh, it's hard to believe that we're finally there, but we are going to start uh, off our Lenten season through the Ash Wednesday service. So please come and join us for that. Uh, we, as part of our Lenten journey, we are doing the Painting the Stars study. It's about science and faith and how they are actually intertwined. It's just an awesome, awesome study. We'll be offering that between services on Sunday morning. Uh, Lydia will be uh, facilitating that discussion. Then Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we will have our Wednesday evening one, and I'll be facilitating that group. Uh, we'll be doing the same lesson on Sunday and Wednesday, so if you uh, can't make a Wednesday, come to the Sunday and vice versa. Uh, just come and join us. You don't need to sign up for that. Just come and participate and share. We're very, very excited about uh, this study coming up. Online auction, we have uh, coming up. Teresa, tell us about what's happening. Hello. So um, the auction is coming up. It will be running from March 30th through April 8th online. And we need to have you register. So I'm looking around and I'm guessing there's a whole bunch of you who are not registered online yet for the auction. There are information sheets out on the table out um, in the foyer. Narthex. I thought it was Narthex, but I wasn't sure. Um, so um, uh, you can, uh, if you have questions, feel free to ask me. But we really need to have you get registered so that you'll get emails telling you what's happening with the auction uh, from Orinoco, Orinoco Online Auction. Also, um, the donations. We need items for the auction in order to make money on the auction. So I would like you to look through your home, find things of value that you're willing to part with that we might be able to um, make some money on for the church. Um, also, if you don't have any items that you're willing to part with, maybe you've got some skills you're willing to part with. Maybe you know how to write a resume that for somebody who needs to find a job like me. Or you know how to cook. Um, or you know how to snow blow. Or you know how to shovel or rake or you know uh, mow. Anything like that, any service. You make, make pies like Ruth does so generously. Uh, we would love those kinds of services donated. Let Debbie know, and she'll make a certificate that they can put on the auction then. So please, please consider um, donating some service. Um, and if you can't do either of those, then maybe you could go and buy a gift card or ask for a donation of a gift card from a, um, a company here in town, a restaurant or a drugstore or, or a sports store or, <coughs> or anything like that. Mm. Um, so, because we, we need items. Um, if we don't have items on the auction, we won't make any money. So uh, please, please consider um, spending some time thinking about that and then finding things for us. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, so please uh, make note of that, uh, turn in those things, those skill sets that you can do and make sure that happens. Tom, how about you? Can you uh, do a love song and donate that love song? Okay, uh, get you right there. We do want to uh, also let you know next week is daylight saving time. So you'll turn your clocks ahead. You're going to lose an hour of sleep. Come sleepy, right? You lose an hour next week, right? Yeah, Wh whatever. Just show up, uh, whatever you want to do with that. We do also want to let you know, uh, Samaritan Bethany Pancake Breakfast, Debbie, can you, or is there another board member? So I'm not sure who's in charge of that. Just go from back there if you can. What's that? Okay. <laughs> so on um, March 30th, we're going to be having a um, pancake fundraiser breakfast to support Samaritan Bethany. The um, Marine um, Wilson is kind of heading that up. But um, for $10 a person, um, you can get all the pancakes. You can eat. We've got tickets at the welcome desk, um, and some of the board members also have tickets. But they are in desperate need of finding somebody to help with um, three different things. One person to help run the dish machine. They're looking for someone to help make the coffee. And they're also looking for someone to help with the convection oven. So if that's one of the skills that um, you feel so inclined to help um, with that fundraiser, they would greatly appreciate it. Either contact me or Marie Wilson, and we'll get you set up. But again, it'll be on um, Sunday, or excuse me, Saturday. I don't even know what day it is anymore. Saturday, March 30th from 8 until noon. That'll be here at Peace Church. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Maybe you got anything? Let's come together and celebrate what God's doing in this uh, time and place. 
and for us to gather together. I invite you, if you're able to, please rise. We join together in singing my beloved. We had to be thanking God because we're going to see the light and the sun's coming out. Amen. Thank you, God, for that bright sunlight, that's for sure. Will you hear these words of scripture with me? My beloveds. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed bright white like lightning. Two men appeared talking with him, Moses and Elijah. They were clothed in splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two with him. As the two were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, It's so good to be here. Let us make this experience last by building shrines in your honor. As he was speaking, a cloud overshadowed them. As the cloud came on, they were all overcome with awe. Then a voice spoke, This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. As the voice spoke, Jesus was seen standing alone. The gathered were speechless and told no one what they had seen. Witnessing into that world, into that transfiguration, let us be in this place together. As we celebrate together in this place, will you be with me in prayer? God, you have called us into a world of light. Be with us in that light. We are compelled to be shrine builders. Help us to be moment livers. For in your name we pray this day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you be a witness? Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? You're going to go really far in the water? Yeah. Are you swimming today? No? Just you're ready to go? You're ready to swim out in that snow, maybe? Maybe? That's true. You would probably get really cold, too. This morning, we have one of my absolute favorite stories um, in our scripture reading. And so we heard it first off. And I'm wondering if you heard anything in there. Yeah. Well, fishing for water is pretty easy. You, you can find it pretty easily. Um, it's I want it. It is. You're right. So when we um, come here and we hear all these scripture readings, some of them are really confusing. Some of them are really visual and easy to act out. So I'm gonna ask somebody. I'm gonna ask for three volunteers first. I need three volunteers. One. You wanna be? One? You wanna be two? You wanna be three? Okay, so number three is Jesus. So Jesus is going to come up on the mountain. And having a conversation, suddenly you're by yourself, but then number one and number two come up. That's you too. Go ahead. You're going to go have a conversation with Jesus up there. Okay, we're going to have to go like this. Ready? Flash, flash. They're there. Moses and Elijah are standing with Jesus. And you're talking really, really emphatically. Can you pretend to talk really, really emphatically? Okay. And then Harriet and Ben are perfect. Go up there. Because then all the disciples wake up. We can actually all come over. The disciples that were there. And they see this. But suddenly they realize these two people weren't there before. And then a cloud comes down on top of them. So now we can't see anything. Okay, everybody close your eyes. You got clouds. You got clouds. You got clouds. And then the cloud lifts, and Moses and Elijah are gone. Ready? One, two, three. And Jesus is left alone. 
Does this make sense? Does it sound like fantasy almost sometimes? Yeah? Come on over here, Ryan. You are, yes. <laughs> Couldn't have typecast you any better, buddy. So sometimes we have these mountaintop experiences where something so amazing happens and it shocks us. And sometimes we're surrounded by the people we understand. Sometimes we don't understand what's going on. But through it all, we get to be together. And so there's a part of that story where all the disciples come, all of us came forward, where Peter says to them that he wants to build a shrine to make it permanent. But he can't. We can't make things permanent. Sometimes we just have to live in the fact that the amazing experiences that we don't understand, the times where we get to be bright like Jesus, all of these things suddenly can shock and we move on. And so today I want us to remember that, that even though we might not have the real memories built there, we're always going to have memories up here, right? And that's what I get to take from being with all of you, is this understanding that even though our time together is over, we'll always have those memories in our brains. So I hope that you go into this week knowing that Every day, you are making more amazing memories together. And that I am grateful that you were all a part of that journey with me. And I hope that you are grateful for me being here as well, because it's been an honor to be with all of you. I know. So will you guys pray with me together? Grab hands if you can. Grab hands. You got it? Gary, you want a finger? There, my girl. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together, helping us share, and learn to love. Amen. Go ahead. Let's give thanks for these gifts. So somebody's asking uh, back here, which is very slow too, but um, <laughs> they're asking about these gratitude envelopes. So let me give you an example. Uh, Dean Pollock, our own Dean Pollock, as you know, we've been praying for Dean. He's been uh, struggling with cancer the last couple of years. Uh, but the last two scans that he had, he's been totally, totally clear. Mm -hmm. Now that is an act of thanksgiving and gratitude. Those are the things that we're talking about. We want you, it doesn't have to be that big or that magnificent, but they can be simple things as well. So just think about that envelope and pray about it or lift them up. Put them where you want them to go, but fill them up with those blessings and those thanksgivings. Let's just take a moment to give thanks for all the gifts that we've received. God, for the blessings we receive, for the joys that we encounter, for the moments we have of your grace, for those moments we can just say thank you, for that privilege that we have to be your people, to share in this ministry, to break bread together, to love together, to be one in spirit, for all those gifts that you give us and those that we return back for the work of this, your church, we give thanks. So be with us and bless all the gifts before us. Bless those who have given them this day. And most importantly, embolden our ministry so that all may see of your good name. We give thanks for this day and today. Amen. We do come to celebrate together around the table and how important it is that we as people of God do so, that we share and we remember those great moments that we have of God's calling us together to be one in spirit and one in body. So we gather together this day to give thanks. And as we do, we remember when Jesus gathered with his disciples. And after a long day's work of ministering and sharing together, and after eating together, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and said, This is given to you. Take this in remembrance of me. In that same way, he took the cup, blessed it, raised it, and gave it to them, saying, Every time that you drink of it, remember me. So we do remember that when we gather around the table, we know that all will be well because God is with us. This table is for everyone and anyone who wishes to come forward because this table doesn't belong to you. You can't take it with you. It does not belong to me or to any of us. It is God's table, and the God that we know and love and embrace is a God that welcomes all. So welcome to the bigger table. God, for all the blessings we receive, those moments of grace we encounter, 
the time that we do gather around table, family and friends, for moments of gratitude and thanksgiving, for all those things as we gather this day, we just give thanks for the opportunity to be your people and be blessed by your presence. Be with us, not only today, but each and every day as we encounter your power. God, we come into this space feeling your creative power of love, to be blessed by our presence together, to be unified as one central body aware of the struggles and challenges of life, the joys and successes for all that we inhabit, for all that we imagine. Be with us, God, in this space. And into that space of prayer, we speak special prayers upon our hearts, upon our minds, for a new medication to bring relief, and for caregivers to feel relief. For those who struggle with anxiety, and for those who love them, that they may be surrounded by the calm compassion of each other. For a terminally ill dear friend, that these final steps in her journey are filled with peace. For a 35-year-old family member who suffered a stroke and heart attack last week. For a grandfather who's in comfort care waiting for the end. And for all who support him, give them strength. Give the grandmother strength. We ask for prayers this day of thanks for the lung transplant of Deb. And we give joy and thanks for all who are able to engage in self-care. We find that it's so important to have gratitude for all of the simple things in our lives. Thankful prayers for a grandson's successful surgery. And blessings on the journey as we all transition together and find new voices and new places and new life. For these prayers and for all that we have yet to speak, we celebrate today God's healing and comforting power of love. Amen. Amen. This morning, we celebrate Transfiguration Sunday with a scripture reading from Exodus, from the story of Moses. So hear these words. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware of his face was radiant because he had spoken with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he came, gave them all the commands that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered God's presence to speak, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites as he had been commanded, they saw his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with God again. As we reflect this morning on that reading, also hear once again these words from Luke. Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men appeared talking with him, Moses and Elijah. They were clothed in splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and awake and saw his glory, as well as the two with him. As the two were about to leave, Peter said, 
It is so good to be here. Let us make permanent this experience and build shrines in your honor. As he was speaking, a cloud overshadowed them. As the cloud came on, they were all overcome with awe. Then a voice spoke, this is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. As the voice spoke, Jesus was seen standing alone. The gathered were speechless and told no one what they had seen. So ends our readings this morning. And I must tell you that I apparently have a rocky relationship with Transfiguration Sunday. It is one of my absolute favorite stories because of just how visual it is. We can imagine that bright white flashing like lightning or a bleached cloth, as another translation puts it, or like freshly fallen snow like we might have outside. And in fact, a few years ago in my first winter in Massachusetts, we had to cancel worship on Transfiguration Sunday because the snow was that heavy, something that church had never done in the life of their other pastor. It was so much that we could barely open the doors of our apartment complex to let Sassy out to do her business in the morning. She literally had to bound through the snow to find a place outside in those two-foot snowdrifts. And last week, it looked much the same here. I guess God is really trying to tell me something about the radiance we hear about today in some very different ways than that community that followed Jesus would have been able to understand. Snow in the Middle East might not have made sense to them, but to us in the frozen spaces we inhabit, snow is much a metaphor for transfiguration and the radiance only God would ask us to understand. For Transfiguration Sunday is about seeing the world in a new way, trying to figure out how we will respond to it. In the passage from Exodus, we hear the story of Moses being transformed by his relationship, his time with the vine. In that building of the relationship, his face changes. He radiates back to the people all that he encounters with God. And the people see the change. So much so that he keeps it covered. How many times in our lives do we make huge transitions and transformations in ourselves, but keep them hidden from the world for the ease of going about our daily lives? And yet, and yet Moses continues to engage in that change day after day and share as much as he can with his community about what that change is doing to him as snow falls and blankets the ground, putting a veil upon our lives, bringing us closer to those closest to us, we're tasked with a double-edged reality of sharing that intimacy with those around us and keeping ourselves from allowing that intimacy to turn into frustration at close quarters and long hours inside. Moses' intimacy with God had a potential to put distance in his relationship with his community, and it was up to him to keep that in check, to lift and to place the veil, aware of both sides. And in our gospel lesson, we once again hear the radiance of Moses in connection with Jesus' transformation in a time of conversation. Jesus transfigures himself and his connection to the divine, allowing a miraculous space to be created right in view, but not inclusive of the disciples. Only three of them are present, and when they do see Jesus' divine intimacy, it confirms a distance between them rather than bringing them closer. A cloud surrounds them. It isn't a space of closeness. It's a veil coming between them. And it's a veil the disciples attempt to pull off to get more intimate but fail. How often do we fail in sharing ourselves authentically and being that open to the intimacy of community. Peter immediately moves into construction mode. Make it more permanent. This is a fleeting moment, and I gotta hold it right here. He wants to build shrines, to commemorate, to put up plaques. If he had a smartphone, he'd probably been fumbling to get it out of his pocket and missed the whole intimacy. In the movie, a Secret, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, one of the characters says, beautiful things don't ask for attention. And this is certainly true of this moment in Jesus' ministry. 
he feels this divine connection, speaks with heroes of his faith about his life to come, and engages in the moment. Peter instead wants to hold it. And it's such a tiny moment in life, a fragile moment where the veil is able to lift. At another point in the movie, the same character says, if I like a moment for me, I don't want to have the distraction of the camera. I just want to stay in it. We've all had these moments of intimacy with the divine, whether it's in the powerful moment in nature or the miracle of wellness following disease or of hurt and the life following it of family turning you away. These moments of intimacy go radiate God's healing energy, God's call to community, our vulnerability showing us how thin the line between fear and action is. This is the crux of transfiguration, seeing and seeking healing, community, and action. Sam and I have a family friend in Missoula, Montana. It's actually, I would say, Sam's best friend. And her family has been under increasing stress over the last year. She has twins, four-year-old, that's enough. One has cerebral palsy, that's enough. And yet they went un underwent an a incredible procedure less than two years ago that allowed him the first ability to walk, stand, sit, lie down without his body working against him. That's enough. It's a transformation on its own, and it's miraculous and intimate, and they've shared that with us over this past year. And then last month, our little four-year-old friend came closer to death than ever before with a sudden battle with RSV. His little body, his mother says, was connected to 17 tubes or machines at one point. And through it all, they shared their lives with us. They're still having to figure out what to do next. On top of that, they have to move from their rental house in the next month. They have a second twin child to, t to work with. Her husband is graduating. All of that is enough. I cannot imagine the situation she has come through in the last year, the fights with insurance, the constant changing care for her son, the work of remaining connected to her well child, of trying to work and pay and be in preschool and figure out regular daily life. Oh yeah, and eat and breathe. And so much goes into her day with her son. And this week, she posted about this journey of the last month with RSV. We continue to process what happened in the last month. We haven't found the humor yet, but our son is psyched that the skin has come back. And the hole is getting smaller on my ankle. If we remember anything specific from this ordeal, she said, I'll be surprised. And it's no wonder she doesn't think she'll remember anything. She's in the midst of a veil moment. Her son, however, is so young that he's been able to stay intimate with the radiating of life. And he can see the healing. He's just living in it. Transfiguration in real life. But many times we're deep in the fear and the response to be open. And unlike this four-year-old child, we're not able to see the ways to find healing. This week was a big one in the family of Christ. Those in the United Methodist Church who've been working for the inclusion of LGBTQ family community in the global UMC church. What's different about the UMC and the UCC is that how decisions are made and accepted. While in the UCC we hold strongly to the idea of shared experience but many voices, that ability for an open and affirming next door to the, those that choose not to be. The UMC's general conference makes official the entire denomination's position on issues and cultural challenges. It makes binding decisions. Or as a friend once explained it to me, when we vote or make a statement, it is the entire global 12 million membership who speak to that, and that's powerful. They're right. But this week, that power shifted in a direction those in the UMC in many places had hoped it would not go. Rather than choosing to become more inclusive for their clergy and their communities that accept and support the whole spectrum of human sexuality, they chose to close ranks and make it more exclusive and punitive to the rainbow LGBTQ community. A pain many Methodist partners, members, and clergy are feeling right now. The church feels like it has failed them. Many of us here have lived through our own experiences of church-created pain. 
and can hear the pain in the body of Christ today. President of the UCC, John Dorhauer, issued a statement in support of those in pain, and he said this, We hold in prayer those whose past wounds have been reopened by the recent debates of the governing body gathered in St. Louis. The body of Christ has, throughout its long history, not always been kind and loving to those who live outside established norms and conformities. We confess to our own history and complicity with racism, misogyny, transphobia, and homophobia. Our hope is that we can and will continue to struggle with closed hearts and minds as we seek to live more fully into the vision of God's shalom for all. He called this dealing with the pain of a new brokenness. And that is what my friends in the UMC Church are doing. In protest following the vote, the progressive delegates and attendees sang on the floor of the conference a song that I used at this morning's traditional service called For Everyone Born. And I'll sing just a little bit. For everyone born, a place at the table. For everyone born, clean water and bread. A shelter, a space, a safe place for growing. For everyone born, a star overhead. The beauty of this song in the Methodist tradition is that they're all really good singers, um, and they can do it in four-part harmony. And as I listened to this little cell phone video of my friend, they used a verse I had not heard before, directly into this space which had just said, queer people aren't okay, they sang, for gay and for straight, a place at the table, a covenant shared, a welcoming space, a rainbow of race and gender and color, for gay and for straight, the chalice of grace. They're calling their world to be creators of justice. And they're calling that out into this community that is saying, you're not welcome. And while the church is in that cloud of injustice that swirls before change can come, the story of transfiguration tells us it won't last. The veil can and will be lifted. A colleague who attended the conference wrote this the morning after the vote. I wake this morning with so much hope and joy. Today might get rough, but oh, the spirit is restless, and we will get shaken up. I praise God for our children that speak louder. Spoiler alert, hate don't win. For his compassion in his community to recognize that they will make a way forward. When I, as a UCC, would probably say I'm out the door, is admirable. It's transfiguration. Transfiguration surrounds us all these days. Personal pain and healing, societal pain and fear-mongering, the calling for action and community, negotiating the emergencies of keeping the plates of kids, work, finances, and still trying to negotiate our dreams at the same time. Transfiguration is needed. And so it's rather fitting that this Sunday is my last Sunday with you all as well as transfiguration is going to be needed here at peace, too. The global church is changing. The needs of the Rochester community are changing. Peace's engagement with community is changing. And all of these things are happening as our ministry is in some flux, too. I've had the honor of hearing from many of you today and over the past month about your own grieving that as we embark on this separation, it's hard for everyone to have a vision of where we thought we were and where we want to be. We engaged in building work together. We listened for the still, small voice of divine transformation together. We tried new things together. We called ourselves to remember and take an active part in our history together, and I'm grateful for it. I don't know that I can be like my little four-year-old friend and see the healing taking place. I might be more like his parents, but I can try. We can try. When Jesus speaks with Moses and Elijah, he speaks about leaving. They were clothed in splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure. Well, now we speak about departure anew. 
What will the future of peace hold in five years, in ten years, in a hundred years? The amazing transformations and transfigurations that are needed here. All of the work that we have done. What will immigration justice look like here? What will church and kids and youth and small groups and time together and eating, and what will that look like here? You have the opportunity to see the thin veil of vulnerability, to battle with a fear of loss and holding on, but also to engage in some truly creative ways of being church together, to shine forth like the radiance of Moses' face, like the flash of lightning, like the brilliance of a rising sun upon freshly fallen snow. This is what is yet to be revealed. While Peter, James, and John battled the sleep, overtaking them at the impossibility of this scene of radiance, transcendence opened before them. Peace is in a position, once again, to see with eyes awoken. What will you call forth? What will create the body of Christ here transfigured at peace? Are you ready to move the cloud away and live in the moment? We cannot be shrine builders. We must be moment livers. Into this space, we invite ourselves into that co-creative work. For God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy. That's how that song chorus goes. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. May God bless us into that work. And may it be so. Amen. (laughs) For my last time here, Let us say in prayer, this is your church. Others will feel welcomed. It will do a great work. It will make generous gifts to many causes. It will be a sanctuary for social justice and peace. It will be a church that embraces all, builds community, grows faith, and transforms lives. Therefore, with the grace of God, be a safe and inclusive church, living God's radical message. Amen. I love you.